I'm taking my thoughts today from the book of John, chapter 13. And this is the only part of the scripture that records the foot washing ceremony. And John seems to have put it in here where the others have, uh, have just not recorded it. Which doesn't mean that it's unimportant. It probably means that John was someone who was touched a little more by this ceremony than were the other apostles. As you read those little books of John, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, you'll discover the theme of those books is love and concern for the church members. He calls them his children, he calls them his dearly beloved. He is concerned for the membership of the church, for their well-being and, from their pure, and for their purity. <clears throat> when we look in chapter 13 of John, we discover that Jesus does something that the disciples thought was a terrible, humiliating and degrading act. Reading from the beginning, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. That evening, there were 13 pair of feet that needed to be washed. And nobody was inclined to do it. Maybe each one of the disciples thought that he would have to wash 12 pair of feet and then perhaps someone would wash his. Maybe some of them thought that there would be a maid around somewhere. They hadn't seen any women around the place, but maybe there was a maid around somewhere who would come and uh, do this, this honour for them. Because it was a normal thing to do at Passover time when people showed their hospitality that uh, someone would be around with a bowl of water to wash the feet of the travellers who came into Jerusalem and sometimes to other places to celebrate the Passover. Hospitality was number one on these occasions and washing of feet was a sign of a host's hospitality. But nobody moved, nobody did it, nobody saw anyone who should do it. I don't think the disciples even thought that one of them ought to do it. I don't think Peter looked at John and, and thought in his heart, John, you better get up and do this. And I don't think James looked at Nathaniel and said to him, you better get up and do it. They just didn't think someone was going to do it for sure. And so I picture them sitting there and waiting, wondering what was going to happen after a little while. And they start looking at their feet, but that's not good. And so they start looking to the side of them a little bit, but there, of course, is another follower of Jesus who's also looking to the side of him whose comrade is looking to the side of him. And eventually he's looking at the wall. And that doesn't look good either. So he looks up and then the next one looks up and they go back along the line and they're all looking up at the ceiling. And that doesn't solve the problem either. And so they look to the left instead of to the right and the same thing happens again. And so they've done the circle and so they look back down at their feet again. But that's the worst place to look. 
because when they see grubby feet, they know that somebody had better do something by now, but nobody's doing anything. Until they see Jesus get up, and Jesus takes off his normal uh, outer garment and uh, to, so as not to impede his uh, movements and to make it so much easier, he goes over and quietly picks up a bowl and tips some water in it and walks over to Judas and offers to wash Judas' feet. Judas accepted quite willingly, apparently. At some stage, Jesus came to Peter. But Peter wasn't too happy about this. For Peter suddenly had a flash of inspiration that said to him, washing feet on this occasion is more than just washing away the dust off Jerusalem's streets. He suddenly realized that on this occasion, the person who was going to wash his feet was the very one whose feet should be washed by himself, Peter. And he thought, how can I let Jesus wash my feet? How can I let my Lord and Master wash my feet? What a degrading thing for the new king of Jerusalem, the new king of the Jews to do to wash our grubby feet. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus said to him, what I do thou knowest not now. You don't understand now what I'm doing, but you shall know later. Later you will come to understand. And so Peter was starting to understand a little bit and uh, Peter had a look at himself in his mental eye and he looked himself over in his moral worth and he thought to himself, it's not just my feet that needs washing, it's the whole lot of me that needs washing. Wash my head, he says, wash my hands as well. He said, I need to be washed in other areas than just my feet. My head is dirty also. I remember walking down a street one day and uh, a bus pulled up at a bus stop. It was a tour bus of some sort, pulled up at this bus stop. Several people poured out the door of the bus and looking for souvenir shops or something or other. One fellow got off, um, stepped a couple of metres away from the entrance to the bus uh, door um, stood on his head and started some kind of, do they call it break dancing, some kind of dancing. Next thing he was on his hips and on his stomach and on his hands and he was back on his head again, twirling around on the concrete pavement. I thought surely this is a recipe for baldness if ever there was one. And the people stood there in amazement. And uh, I had to stand there as well. I just couldn't believe it did a marvellous job. He was an entertainer in his own right, I'm sure. He must have practised this a lot. And then he shook himself a little bit and walked back in the bus and sat down again. And a few people clapped and cheered, hoping he'd come out and repeat it, but he didn't. And I thought to myself, fancy getting your nice slick hair, all grubby and dirty, in, uh, in the dust and dirt of the street. But Peter saw himself as having a head that needed washing as well. Not just the dust and dirt that blows around the streets of Jerusalem and Palestine. He was thinking about the dust and dirt that's deep inside here. The dust and dirt that seems to make its appearance whether we like it or not. I had a grandmother who was a very fussy lady. She was a great worrier, worried about all sorts of things. And as I remember, the furniture in the home was not too, not too smart, but she always had a little thing of polish there, some sort of polish, and I think it was kerosene and beeswax that she made up, and she always polished this little table. She had a little uh, half table. You know, they were popular back in those days. I'm thinking about 
um, 55 years or more ago. I won't tell you the more. But uh, she had this little half round table, which was a, a really a lovely little bit of work. And uh, she would polish this table, I think, about every day. And you know when you polish furniture with French polish finish on it every day, with that sort of thing, the polish seems to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And soon you can look into it and you think you're looking into a big thick resin. And uh, she liked this table. It was probably the, a bit of furniture she received uh, for a wedding gift or something like that. I never did find out and I don't know what happened to it. But I remember one day when we, we went to visit. She jumped up in great alarm, sitting on the old, uh, old couch, you know, these old-fashioned couches, um, sort of had a spring base sort of a thing. She jumped up in great alarm. And Mum said, whatever's the matter, Grandma? What's the matter? And she grabbed a little cloth and she rushed over to this table and she, she got on the right plane and, and with the right angle shining there, she got it just right and she wiped off just the minutest little bit of dust. <clears throat> and we kids thought this was a huge joke. A little bit of dust, if she'd come to our place and seen the dust on our table, poor grandma would have been shocked and horrified. She'd have spent the week there polishing the table to get rid of the little bit of dust. But I believe God is concerned about the little speck of dust that's in each one of our heads. The little specks of unlikeness to Jesus that's in our heads. And Peter had a little spiritual insight that moment. Lord, wash my head. We all have the problem, don't we? We all have the problem. We think we're going fine until something cuts across our path and we discover there's some specks of dust in our head. Specks of philosophical dust. Where we suddenly realise our attitude towards someone has suddenly taken a very nasty turn. Our attitude perhaps even towards ourselves has suddenly taken a very nasty turn. And what we thought was in there was lovely green moss and uh, everything pure and, and crystal-like suddenly we realize it's more like mud than like beautiful clear water. Suddenly we realize that we're not so Christ-like as we thought. And then Peter, of course, had his hands. Peter was pretty good with his hands. He scaled and gutted many thousands of fish. He'd been not too bad with the sword and he was going to try it again very soon. He was pretty good with his hands. I imagine Peter had won many a fight on the street. I guess nobody failed to pay Peter for the fish they purchased from him because he had ways, I'm sure, of getting satisfaction even if it wasn't in cash. Peter was a fellow who was quick with his hands, I'm sure, and he realised in that flash of inspiration, that flash of spirituality, he realised, Lord, I'm not the kind of person that you ought to be washing the feet of. But if you want to clean me up, wash my head and wash my hands as well. Now Jesus said something very strange. Very strange. Verse 10, Jesus says, He that is washed doesn't need to wash again except to wash his feet. But he's every bit clean. And then he looks at the apostles and he says, You're all clean, but for one, because Jesus knew who would betray him, and he was thinking of Judas. What was Jesus getting at? I believe that Jesus knew that 11 of those disciples of his were totally committed to him. He knew that 11 of them would die for him. Hadn't they already said they would go to Jerusalem and die with him if that's the way he wanted to go? Eleven of those disciples would have done anything that Jesus asked them to do. And had Jesus asked any of them to get the basin and wash each other's feet, they would have done it willingly because Jesus asked them to. And Jesus knew that it was in their mind to serve him as faithfully as they knew how. And so he says, you know, what happens is 
the big cleansing has taken place. Peter, when you committed your ways to me, the big cleansing took place. There might be some specks in your head and there might be some dust on your hands, but that'll all come right. But from time to time, those feet of yours need washing because it's the feet that take you along the pathway. And I think Jesus was thinking in terms of a pathway, a track, a way to a destination. And as he was talking about the washing of feet, he wanted his disciples to understand that from time to time, we go down little pathways that's not really characteristic of one who follows Christ but is very much the part of every sinful human being. And so Jesus washed Peter's feet and the other disciples' feet. And then he suggested that we should all do the same. Verse, 18, <coughs> uh, verse 14, let's go verse 13. You call me Master and Lord, Jesus says, and you are quite right, because that's who I am. If I have, as your Lord and Master, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And I think Jesus was saying as we wash one another's feet, we're acknowledging that we've all gone down the same paths. We're all needing to wash off the same kind of dust. I think Jesus was thinking in terms of what is common to human nature. And all human nature goes off the track somewhere along the line. And although you may have been washed, you may have been baptised, you may have committed your ways to Jesus, our nature is such that from time to time we let that close association slip a little and we go off on a little path of our own. And Jesus says from time to time you need to come back and wash the dust of your journey off your feet and start again. So as we come to the communion service, we do so in the Seventh-day Adventist church by washing one another's feet. The men take a partner and they wash uh, a friend's feet and the ladies likewise. And we are acknowledging in all humility that we need to be washed and you need to be washed. I need to be washed and you need to be washed. There is a commonality about it. We're brought down to a common denominator where we are all the same in the sight of the Lord and in the sight of one another. And Jesus says, <coughs> For I have given you an example so that you should do as I have done to you. Surely, he says, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent him greater than he that is sent. If you know these things, Jesus says, you will be happy if you do them. Jesus doesn't give us empty promises. And he suggests to us that we should do this because it will bring us happiness. How will it bring us happiness? It will bring us happiness because we will, in our hearts, once again, recognise the cleansing power of Jesus. And in spite of our weaknesses and in spite of our human nature and our human tendencies and in spite of the little things that have so upset us and made us a little less Christ-like since last we met for this occasion, we can have it all cleaned up and Jesus will say, you're washed and you're clean and I see you as if you've never sinned at all. That's enough to make you happy, isn't it? Brian was going to say something. I know he was going to say, wow, hallelujah. That's enough to make you happy, isn't it? That you can come from time to time to this special occasion knowing that Jesus sees you as if you've never sinned at all. Is Jesus telling a lie? No, he's not. He knows you've sinned, but he's taken them away. He says, I'll take responsibility for that. Wash it away. I'll take responsibility. Leave it to me. And we can leave our communion service knowing that we are clean and free. So just before we separate for our foot washing, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads in prayer of dedication. Then we can proceed out to the hall and to the little room on the left there 
wherever we will <coughs> have the foot washing ceremony. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful today that we can still come to you and that you look down from your heavenly throne upon us with the same compassion as you did to those disciples of old. And if you were here today, you would wash 12 pairs of feet or 20 pairs of feet and do it happily, for you would know it would be teaching us that in your hands sins are dealt with and are washed away. So we pray that we will enter into this service with confidence that Jesus is our saviour, that Jesus is our friend, and may we enter into it with a humility and compassion for our fellow believers. We ask please in Jesus' name. Amen.